Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Shindig. I'm your usual host, Dr. Tom Horn, and it's brought to you by the Red River Archaeology Group. We've got another fantastic episode for you today. It's with Claire Boucher Sullivan, and she's talking about open air Irish rock art. Of North Atlantic rock art in Ireland, it's it's fantastic. And I suppose, you know, it was an area that hadn't been, you know, studied in depth before. So that's that amazing rock art you've seen. Maybe you think of the cup and ring marks. Um, you'll see it on sort of essentially sort of boulders in the landscape or in the living rock. And it's something that's fascinated archaeologists and fascinated humans for thousands of years since the Neolithic. Of course, they can include, you know, passage grave art that we have um, in Ireland and on the continent, and also, um, you know, the, the prehistoric um, North Atlantic rock art, which um, which I would be, uh, which I would uh, focus on. Claire's research is fascinating because she's looking at how we protect these open air sites from natural, animal, you know, rain, threes, frost action, all the things you'd expect, you know, outdoor art to experience. Um, so, do you know, there are a lot of, um, do you know, there are a lot of records of, of panels being blown up with dynamite or, do you know, going missing. She's doing a lot of research into how we can protect these amazing open air, ancient prehistoric art sites and uh, if you listen to the rest of this I think you'll find that it's it's the art itself is fascinating but the work that Claire and others are doing to preserve it is is really just as interesting. Hi Claire thanks so much for joining us today on Shindig. Um, I think I'd just like to start with a really general question because you know we want to bring new people to archaeology and, and history so um, I always like to start just the very sort of general sort of terms. So what in the most general terms is prehistoric rock art? Um, so I suppose rock art in general is any like images and um, carvings, drawings um, or paintings on rock surfaces. And these vary um, dramatically from, you know, all corners of the globe. They can include the painted rock shelters in, in South Africa. They can include the um, rock art in Valcamonica in Italy and um, where there's multi-phase carvings. And then, of course, they can include, you know, passage grave art that we have um, in Ireland and on the continent and also um you know the the prehistoric um north atlantic rock art which um which i would be uh, which i would uh, focus on so it's very, this is it's it. very yeah it, it's i mean it's such it's it's a very broad church um but you as you're saying there you focus on a a specific form of it and it's it's a form that i know having in my commercial archaeology uh field digging days i've i've uh, wandered around misty uh hillsides in scotland trying trying to trying to find it and just for our listeners to know it's it's pretty difficult <laughs> as sure we'll get into um with with the effects of 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 erosion and and uh, lichen and bog cover that's very easy to, to miss stuff even if you know kind of what you're looking for so i suppose then we want to talk about atlantic rock art and that that's your field of speciality so what is Atlantic rock art? Uh, where do you find it? And what sort of period and time are, are people carving these? Um, so uh, Atlantic rock art, um, it's kind of characterized by its its distribution along the North Atlantic coast. So you can find it in, um, you know, northern uh, Spain and Portugal. So Galicia would be the most common um, place for it there. Um, and then a across um across the UK and you know in clusters um across the island of Ireland. Um, and I suppose it's mostly characterized by cup and ring motifs. Um, and these these cup and ring motifs kind of occur in variations, you know, um, various different um, you know, um I suppose um collaborations or various different patterns across the surfaces of, of these rocks. And I suppose there are some um limited examples then of um you know uh I suppose um I don't know how I how I describe it I suppose kind of like um distinctive patterns um in in different valleys and different landscapes you know you would have kind of you know a specific um cup and ring motifs um and variations of it that would be common throughout different landscapes um so yeah I suppose that's kind of how you would you would characterize it so e even though it, it covers this broad area I come from sort of Spain sort of Portugal I think sort of through Brittany and and, and Britain and, and the island of, of of Ireland but you're saying they're sort of they're almost like regional 
accents within it then you're you get certain clusters of particular styles of these these cup and cup and ring marks and uh, what other what other motifs are, are we finding and, i mean just maybe explain a bit more about the the cup and the ring marks and what other motifs that you're finding in in these rock art yeah, of course. And um, yes, there can be and um, definitely like, you know, in, in certain regions, I have noticed kind of a commonality between like, you know, certain the reoccurrence of certain, you know, um, collaborations of these motifs um, on, on rock surfaces. And I suppose um, another really common motif would be um, a rosette motif or, um, for example, um, cup and ring motifs with radial grooves. So that would be like, you know, and that there's actually variations in that also, you know, it could be like, you know, the cup mark is, you know, a hollow man-made depression and, um, you know, surrounded by a, a pick marked normally or peck marked um, circular, you know, enclosing ring. And then sometimes the radial groove would come directly from the center of the cup mark, but sometimes it would come from, you know, the first outer ring or you know there could be up to you know there could be any number of surrounding rings on you know on certain cup marks you know I've, I've found up to like eight and and stuff like that you know so there is there's different variations but you know to identify north atlantic rock art um you know it would be like some variation of, of the cup and ring cup and ring radial groove rosette do you know so so i suppose again it's very easy for us as archaeologists to sort of to, to get into it and before i sort of ask about you know sort of meaning and maybe how you know how this comes to be and how it, how it comes to spread across this region just back to the basic this is just people with stone tools just chipping away at these exposed area of living rocks a rock that's still part of part of the earth if you will is is, is that the the impression that we should take away Yes, well, um, I suppose what is distinctive about the, the North Atlantic tradition, especially like in Ireland, in Ireland specifically, is that the majority um, of these cup and ring motifs are found on boulders and outcrops. And they're often found, you know, the clusters of them are in quite rural settings. Um, and, you know, so, for example, just briefly, my study area was, was Cork and, and Kerry, and there'd be huge landscapes in Kerry where there'd be like like any number of, of large boulders and outcrops and um, the, they'd be sandstone and the motifs would occur on the surface of those so they would be like you know glacial erratics as opposed to kind of you know smaller stones all right and it is just it's it's these are carved about five thousand years ago what what's the period are, are we kind of talking about um so i suppose um that is, you know, it's it's impossible, as you know yourself, to to date to date the art as much as we'd love a specific um a specific date. I suppose um it's it's uh, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age is is kind of the the I suppose the the most favoured um period of you know the creation of these panels. Um, so I suppose you know um again it's it's impossible to to get a specific date, but that would be the the proposed theory that it would be. Do you know there are um you know some theories that would suggest it's earlier Neolithic um and then you know into the into the early Bronze Age. So I suppose it is impossible to for definite say you know the exact period, but I suppose I'd be definitely in the mindset that it was a little bit earlier than the early Bronze Age. Do you know myself? So it'd be like late Neolithic. Well, that's yeah, that's interesting. I I. I the problem is because of so very few of them have actually been sort of excavated archaeologically, you know, the area around it. And we'll talk yes. uh, briefly later about the work that um, uh, Blaise O'Connor did on, on one particular um, site uh, in Ireland um, that maybe gives us some clues as to a sort of rough sort of dating parameter. But I think our listeners are sort of kind of aware, hopefully they've seen some images um, they've maybe seen a map of the the the, the distribution, um, and I suppose they, you know I, I, as a sort of privilege of of being the interviewer of this and talking to lots of interesting people, I sort of look at things in terms of of networks and sort of Viking Age in terms of distribution, how things move around, and that often includes art styles as well as the actual objects and wells. If I'm looking at, at sort of jewelry or, or or coinage. How do you think, does this spread or is it, you know, is it one of these things like it's a sort of spontaneous response to particular stone types or, 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 or climatic conditions? Or do you think there's, there is maybe some sort of movement of people or, or trade or, or, or networks that are connecting these, these really sort of disparate groups of people? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I suppose I, I on that one, I, I wouldn't have a definitive answer, but just in terms of the, the distribution of the art in Ireland, it is so, you know, it's very, um, very definitive in terms of, you know, the distribution you know, there's the highest uh, concentration is in Cork and Kerry, you know, Carlo, Wicklow, Louth, Monaghan, Donegal. So it is in clusters throughout the whole the whole of Ireland. And then there are isolated examples elsewhere. Do you know there are you could walk into a, a rural landscape and there could be over a hundred examples, and then you could go to the next town over and find one. You could go to, you know, for example, the Mohill Stone is the only recorded example from Waterford. So it is, it's so, you know, that's such a it's such an interesting distribution, I suppose, but there are clear, you know, there is clear evidence for, you know, the the production of rock art in these in these specific landscapes. Okay, so yeah, yeah. So we we, we could sort of say we, we don't know it could be a sort of spontaneous, but you know, with the mobility of people, you one never knows, and that's that that's something that's something maybe for for the distant future when we've got a lot more data. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I won't I won't press you on that on that <laughs> now. Um, but I will ask an equally difficult question early in the in the podcast. You know, people will be thinking why. You know why are they out in all conditions? You know, you know we we both traipse the hills of of of, of Scotland and and Ireland and, and valleys, finding finding these wonderful bit, bits of art. And often weather conditions aren't good. Often the the surrounding land is sort of boggy and and, and and peaty. And even with climatic change, you can imagine they weren't sort of tropical paradises back uh, several thousand years ago. Why do you think so much resource, as we say as an archaeologist, why so much effort, if you will, has gone into creating these incredible motifs? Um, well, I suppose, like, just, um, I mean... Um, <laughs> that's a tricky I, suppose one. I, I suppose I'm asking what, what, you know, what are the theories that people have okay, had, yeah. whether you agree with them or not, in terms of... Why, why they're there? What is their meaning of, of them? Is it a language? Is it related to uh, the, the movements of the, the, the seasons or the stars? Just anything like that. And I won't yeah. hold you to any of them, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, cool. Well, I suppose, you know, obviously, you know, as we can't date them and, and there's been limited excavation, I suppose it is. And, you know, these kind of prehistoric mo monuments, they're kind of, you know, open to interpretation and, you know, interpretation in line with, with you know, they could kind of fall into a number of different theories and, you know, tick a number of boxes. But I suppose um, the theory that I'd be, you know, most likely, um, you know, kind of, you know, I'd fall, in, fall into the camp of they were possibly boundary markers. Do you know, um, I suppose Avril Purcell did a study um, and very much in line with um, some of Richard Bradley's um, teachings and, and theories on how these panels kind of occur, you know, and the different positioning and, and in situ positioning of them across the landscapes would kind of, um, you know, imply that they could be boundary markers. Um, Avril Purcell did say that some of the more elaborate panels were um, kind of on higher uh, landscape positioning in, in these mountainous regions. And maybe they were reserved for certain members of the society and and you know maybe the the ones that were less elaborate were you know designed for other members of the societies but i suppose again like you know this was only we only have like you know there are so many landscapes left to be explored so i suppose you know that's that's a great theory and um, you know and i would think it would be something along those lines um but you know i suppose there's so much left to be discovered that it's impossible to have a definitive you know definitive theory forever right now yeah and that's and that I think that's one of the joys of archaeology that I think I was saying in other podcasts, you know, we're you know, at best, even for the sort of more historic or proto-historic periods that I do, we're only going to get 0. 0.000001 of 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 the the evidence. So when you're taking that back, you know, thousands and thousands of years, you can understand why as I've been reading some of your really interesting work, and we'll give out links to to your work and other talks that you've done that you you you're sort of talking about. You know, what you actually have to do is look at it in terms of landscape, look at it in terms of, of boundaries and, and try and look at where the set. So you might be doing lots of landscape analysis. And do you do things like view shed analysis on, on any of these or has anyone done that? Is that, is that an area that, that people are sort of looking into? 
Yes, um, Caitlin O'Neill, actually, her her thesis, her master's thesis from 2019, um, she did did that. She did that. And she also looked at um, the different like paleo environments um, of, you know, these prehistoric landscapes. So that was kind of her where she was coming at it from. And, and Avril Purcell also, that was kind of her her one of her um, main objectives in her thesis was to kind of look at it from the, you know, kind of map the the layout and the in situ positions of, of the panel. So there has been a little bit of work done on that, I suppose. Um, Caitlin O'Neill's um, the paleo environment study, that was kind of, you know, that's kind of very, very new and very, you know, the way she can, you know, um, I suppose use uh, the software available and, you know, the different archaeological um, software programs that can help her kind of, you know, get some kind of, of feeling of what the landscape was like and, you know, kind of develop new theories and and kind of, you know, uh, shed new light on on these situations so it is it's great and i suppose now we've got a sort of a bit of a, a sort of more general understanding i really want to now ask you about your research so you know i you know this this question will involve me asking you you know where do we find uh, the rock art in in ireland you talk about this sort of concentrations just a sort of reminder to the audience of, of where that is and yeah, and just the regions that that, that you study, and, and maybe yeah, just your reasons be, behind 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 doing that. Um, yeah. So I suppose um, how I really got into the whole um, you know, the rock art side of things was um, I did my um my dissertation for my um my BA on passage grave art. Um, and then through that, I kind of, you know, researching that, I found these other papers and, you know, these other references to a different kind of art, which I had no knowledge of or, you know, wasn't, you know, wasn't as kind of widely studied. And I kind of was just intrigued by it. So then when I went to do my research master's, I suppose I kind of looked at with my supervisor and um, Professor William O'Brien, we kind of looked at different landscapes and, you know, where I would base, you know, my, my research on this. So we looked at areas that hadn't been like highly studied before. So there was some some view shed analysis there was some um you know there were different aspects of this rock art um considered before but not since Avril Purcell's um you know fantastic study of Derry Nablaha um in in the early 2000s and prior to that it was Finola Finley in the in the 70s of this particular Cork and Kerry South uh, West landscape. So we kind of took a different approach and we looked at the conservation um, of this. And I suppose to have as part of this study, then it was, you know, to get a, a, a body to, to look at a body of studied a kind of, a you know, a good collection of panels to kind of assess for the thesis. I had to compile a catalog of a hundred plus panels and they were then in, in the Southwest region. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of how we, we decided on the, those landscapes landscapes and then you know to pick the particular landscapes I suppose um do you know the Derry Nablaha um was and Dorini they're probably the most two you know they're right next to each other those townlands and I suppose they're probably the most well known um rock art landscapes in in Kerry up until very recently and I think now like on the opposite side of of the Evra Peninsula there are the townlands of Kuma Saharan Letter West and Keel Duff Upper and I think they are quickly quickly becoming the arguably arguably the highest concentration of rock art um in Ireland at the moment so it, it's really it's it's really great how it's kind of all all unraveling like there are other researchers and, and enthusiasts you know discovering new panels there and um, so it, it's great so I think I picked the right area to study. <laughs> and it's excellent. The whole, you know, if we if we show up one of your distribution maps, you can see that concentration. This is, you know, it's, you know, as Claire's alluding to there, this this is this is not an accident. There are a lot. The people in that area are very, you know, even accounting for the fact that there's there there's a lot more to find. You suspect that that sort of overall density is not going to change massively. So this is a real locus of of this sort of form of of activity. Um, so I can absolutely understand you you sort of focusing on 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 that area, but within that you 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 mentioned the word conservation, and that's really your kind of area of expertise, isn't it? It's looking at how these are degraded either by human, animal, natural, climate action, um, and you know how how that changes over time, and maybe what we can do to help preserve them. So. Can you just give everyone just a little bit of an idea? You know, I also say that it's a classic two-minute elevator pitch of if you're explaining your interest in the con the conservation of these sites and uh, 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 of these wonderful stones, um, you just sort of tell the listener and the viewer what 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 your work is. 
Yeah, so I suppose my work is on the conservation of, of the panels. So um, because there are so many, we have, you know, so many, um, you know, fantastic examples of, of North Atlantic rock art in Ireland. It's it's fantastic. And I suppose, you know, it was an area that hadn't been, you know, studied in depth before. And it's definitely, you know, I, I found, you know, it was very it was very appealing to me and, and to my to my supervisor also. And I suppose what we were what we're looking at in terms of conservation is, you know, the the state of the rock art, and um, and what really comes to play into play here is, you know, the earlier accounts, the antiquarian accounts, the antiquarian drawings, the antiquarian rubbings of the surface, and um, they're invaluable in this study as, you know, they're kind of your base, you know, where you base your 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 analysis on, and um, so like, you know, for example. Um, you know, you could have a fantastic drawing of a of a panel from like, you know, the early 20th century. Um, and then, you know, you go to to look at that panel and it's so badly weathered and eroded that you, can, you it's, it's difficult in some cases to even say, you know, you're really, is that, the, and you know, in rock art, it's like, is that the right rock? That's kind of, you know, a common yeah. thing anyway. But like, you know, you really are like, heck, is that the right one? Do you know? So um, I suppose that's that's kind of what, what I'm looking at and, and, you know, kind of looking at these elements that do, you know, that cause damage and destruction to the surface of, of the panels. And then what what are, I mean, I've, 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 said, it, I've said that the animals and humans are all very, very vague, but what are the sort of the, the sort of biggest threats to 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 this Atlantic raw car uh, at, at the moment? OK, so I suppose um, we do have the National Monuments Act, which is great in terms of, you know, the human, the protection the the like legislation and provisions for you know the protection of our our national monuments but i suppose prior to that do you know cause the um, the rocks were so big, they were so large, um, and you know the obviously the, the larger ones sometimes had fantastic and elaborate uh, motifs on them. But you know, back in in the you know the eighteen hundreds and nineteen hundreds, they were in a farmer's way. So he was trying to um, you know like you know plant uh, crops. He was trying to you know rear animals, and there was this giant rock in the middle of the the field that was of no use to him, and he obviously didn't understand the significance. And um, so you know there are a lot of um, you know, there are a lot of records of, of panels being blown up with dynamite or, you know, going missing and, um, right. you know, only found in, in someone's ditch in a few different pieces. Do you know, there are examples of that. So, do you know, unfortunately, like in some cases, it's great because we do have earlier accounts of these, even though we can no longer find the, the panel in situ. But, you know, um, if we had, if the earlier accounts is really, is really great because at least we have a record then and a rough idea of its in situ landscape of like, you know, what townland it was in. So then, do you know, if, you know, as time goes on and greater studies kind of happen, do you know, we'll have an idea of, of you know, roughly where, where the panel were but you know human I suppose would be would be a big factor do you know there are cases of vandalism whether intentional unintentional do you know people might not the, the biggest thing I think is awareness so to bring awareness of rock art because you know for example if people didn't know what it was they could go out and they could you know carve their their initials I found it a few times people's initials carved into the the rock but I know yeah but um <laughs> like, you know, it's kind of <laughs> I've been like oh god but um you know I've, I found that and and um do you know it's obviously it's a little bit heartbreaking but you know in some instances half the panel is covered in you know in in blanket piece so maybe they didn't see the the art maybe they didn't you know really know the significance it could have you know you know it's kind of just highlighting the significance even though you know we don't specifically know the exact meaning and significance behind it you know trying to preserve you know to preserve the art will kind of you know in, in time you know hopefully we'll we'll yield some more theories on that but i think human human interaction and, and you know um protection from from human agency is really really important and you know through through raising awareness that's kind of what we we hope to do and we're certainly going to talk a bit a bit more about that later but you know everyone now is, thinks about climate change mm -hmm. and i imagine that will affect you know it's known as open air um, Atlantic rock art, so it faces all the threats twenty four hours a day. What mm -hmm. are what are those? What are the sort of long term sort of climatic um, threats to rock art, and then maybe what are the more sort of recent sort of human uh, uh, changes to 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 the climate that are affecting these uh, the, 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 these um, panels. Yeah. Okay. So I suppose globally, the number one threat to rock art, any kind of rock art all over the world 
is rain, rainwater. And we certainly know all about that here in Ireland. So um, I suppose, do you know, between, uh, you know, the rainwater and and specifically freeze thaw action freeze thaw action um during my my study out in in letter west um i brought a um a lovely geologist with me to kind of look at the the surface of the of the panels and kind of help me identify the main um you know causes of this natural weathering and he did notice on a number of the panels that freeze thaw action was was definitely at play um do you know i suppose what happens basically is when you know when it rains and the temperatures are cold which we also know about here in Ireland and um, the rainwater freezes in the cracks and the joints within the rock surface and then that causes them to expand by up to like 10 percent so eventually that weakens the rock and then will cause some of the rock surface to break away so that will do you know I know it doesn't oh sure it's only a little bit like it's only 10 percent but over time then you know we will lose an awful lot of the the surface um carvings you know so so that's kind of a big one you know apart from that there is you know um microflora such as lichens and um you know uh like blanket peat and with lichen for example i also dragged a, a poor lichenologist with me out to to who i didn't bring to carry with me to look at rocks but um no there's a, a lichenologist came with me and he identified um a number up to up to a couple of hundred different species of lichen on the surface of some of the panels and you know that did obviously worry me slightly when he was saying oh that's an aggressive one and you know i i you <laughs> yeah. know i learned a lot about but um yeah so but what we what we gathered from we looked at a number of panels in the study area and what we what we really did notice and which was a, a, as a relief to me um was that some of the most of the lichens were slow growing so they would have been there for hundreds of years and you know the damage that they're causing compared to you know modern you know, if we were to peel it all off and let it grow back, you have pesticides in the air from the surrounding farmers. You know, there's an awful lot of other elements that, you know, would impact and would, you know, create a more damaging form of lichen um, on, on the panel surface. So I think it was it was best that, you know, it's a, it's a good thing, but it's not a good thing. But, you know, it, it's better than what we could have now, do you know. So I suppose, you know, doing the photogrammetry and the laser scanning and stuff on the surfaces of the panels, you know, we can kind of see underneath the the microflora so we can identify um some of the of the art without kind of disturbing the, the surface and just leaving the the microflora as it is because you know it's it's a less harmful option in in this case you know and and that's it your work is sort of noticeable notable for its sort of innovative use of all the non-invasive techniques that you may have heard of you and Claire's just mentioned photogrammetry and and also laser scanning so for people who don't really know so much about archaeology but are interested in in you know what, what it is and, and its future and current sort of developments and using technology could you tell us a little more so if you've got a panel of this beautiful rock art what are you doing then and what is photogrammetry doing and, and what is laser scanning doing that's different and and how does it let you you see things without as you say scraping off lichen or or or, or the blanket bog yeah well i suppose with blanket bog you're you're kind of stuck in terms of the the laser scanning and stuff it, it wouldn't be able to you know you wouldn't get a you'd have to kind of remove that if you were to scan it and that's kind of against um against i suppose the you know the 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 best practice so um with regard to the lichen and um, though i mean you photogrammetry was was the first kind of one of those that i that i employed the new technologies and um, and photogrammetry is actually fantastic i'm a huge huge believer in preservation by record i think it's fantastic i think it's what you are like what we need to go go for in the future i definitely think it's, it's you know absolutely brilliant and um, and with regard to the rock art, um, you know, it's so accessible photogrammetry, you know, it's, it's you know, it's it was employed in the Northumberland Rock Art, or the Northumberland Durham Rock Art Project, um, where people recorded panels. Um, so, so yeah, basically what, what it is, is you can go out to a rock, a piece of rock art and you have a camera, you know, just, a, it doesn't have to be super, super high quality, just a normal kind of good enough camera. And you can take, the way I did it was, um, you can take photographs of the panel from, you know, three, you know further away then a little bit closer then closer again and different parts of the of the rock art and then you can get like ArcGIS or another any other kind of you know photogrammetry software upload your images and it will create a model of the panel for you 
And then this, you know, there'll be a mesh and a model and you'll be able to identify then on this model, you know, um, for example, hollow, circular hollows, grooves that you may not have seen with the naked eye. So it's, it's great. And then you'll have that like you know that re record there so if anything was to happen to the panel or you know you know if you had to cross reference if you saw you know you know you'd have that record there and it's so easily accessible and you can upload it then to you know um you know any online portals or make it accessible to people that may not have you know that may not be able to go out to the field to see it so then again that would be kind of you know reiterating the awareness and raising more awareness around it um, and then I suppose laser scanning would be kind of a more intense um, version of this. Um, so I suppose um, myself and the archaeology department in, in UCC went out with um, the laser scanner um, to record a number of panels also. Um, and I think the the most, yeah, so I suppose this was, this was, this is great. I love laser scanning as well. I think it's fantastic in terms of, um, you know, the visibility. I know photogrammetry is fantastic, but obviously laser scanning just gives you that bit more detail. Um, so yeah, so I suppose it it really does showcase the full extent of the of the carvings um, and the, and the motifs on the panel surface. It's it's really really great. And again, um, you know those models can be uploaded to any you know online portals or made accessible to anyone who would you know who would not necessarily have access to them. But they are great tools for pres preserving by record. And again, photogrammetry is so accessible that it can be you know employed in a number of like community projects or even just by enthusiasts. And then that will add to the our, you know, our understanding and, and to the overall archaeological record, which is fantastic. And, yeah, you know, it's because it's, it's, it's clear sort of talking about photogrammetry and, and laser scan models, you think to the website Sketchfab, which I know that yes. you, you, you're certainly using, uh, many people are aware of, but, you know, for, for non-archaeologists out there, people who are maybe not been to this website, it's where lots of archaeologists upload their 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 projects and you can get these amazing 3d scans that you can sort of turn around as 3d models and you can look at the detail and you can zoom in and out a lot of them are annotated as well a lot of them are sort of linked to certain projects so you'll have a whole range so you might have a whole range of ones of rock art or if you're looking at early medieval sculpture there'll be ones there so it's a great resource for just the the, the general public to look at what really skilled archaeologists like claire are 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 doing and you you were talking there about preservation by 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 uh re record as being you, your sort of number one thing as a way of recording it's something that you know the sort of citizen archaeologists can can do themselves you know everyone listening to this can 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 get involved but what what are the um i know you in your work you talk about sort of the other ways of doing it uh as well you've you've talked about legal maybe expand a wee bit on, on that but also there are some in museums, there are some that are protected by sort of cattle grids because livestock rubbing against stones uh, as an early medievalist as well, I'll tell you that is that's an issue. And I imagine it's the same for, for prehistoric stones. So so how, you know, I suppose I'm asking, how do we protect Atlantic rock art? So, you know, you've mentioned some of them, but maybe just talk a bit more of these in terms of museums as a physical barriers and and, and, and ways of doing it like that. Yeah, so I suppose there there have been a few examples, um, you know, that I've come across in the study area that do have actual physical barriers in place to protect the the panels from cattle or you know from livestock, which is great to see. Um, do you know what it is great? But I suppose the majority again are just in my study area, um, are just in this these massive, huge, like, like so like like massive landscapes um of you know rural landscapes and you know to try and preserve every single one of those from from mountain sheep or from goats or which would be you know common in the area it would be nearly nearly impossible um and again just with some of the the more um natural agencies for example like you know blanket peat blanket peat would you know cover some of these surfaces but now it's receding which is how we're finding the new panels and what happens is although it preserve preserves the panel it also like leaches you know some of the rock it leaches the rock, leaving the surface quite um, delicate. So then if you've hoofed animals walking over it, then, you know, it, it'll definitely weaken the surface. So it, it is hard in terms of trying to preserve individual panels in rural landscapes like that. But it is really, really great to see the initiatives taken by some landowners um, you know, to, to preserve the panels. And, you know, they, they kind of have an awareness and an understanding of these these panels and and, um, you know, even whether even if it's not like because there are a lot of panels actually that do have some folklore around them or, you know, some some, you know, story and 
you know, I know like from coming from a scientific aspect with, with the thesis, I have to also like admire the way that there is, you know, this kind of folklore attached to it because it does give, whether it's, it's right or it's not right, or, you know, whatever way you want to look at it, I suppose it gives the awareness and it gives the um, importance to these monuments to continue to, to be protected, you know? So I suppose that's another way, that's another thing then that you, you would come across. But I suppose in terms of the, the actual physical barriers, there are cattle grids, there are sometimes, you know, fences around them. And, and that is, that's really, you know, where, where possible, that's, that's great to see, you know? And I know you, I imagine you'll be a purist and open air in your research is, is probably a clue, but what do you think about the approach that you do get? And I've seen it in my early medieval world as well, when, when the, the, you start to put a glass case around it, or in some cases, they're sort of removed indoors entirely to museums. I imagine that's, you know, that that's, is it a horses for courses sort of thing? It, you know, for certain stones, that's the best way of looking after them. Do you just see it as a case by case basis? Or are you very much, if it, if it can be stay out, you know, where it is originally, so we can get that idea of, of where it is in, in the landscape, that that's the most important thing for you? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, for example, like I, I definitely be of the mindset where leave it where it is so that we can get a full idea of, you know, the in situ landscape and try and understand further understand the distribution. And, um, you know, because I think removing the panels from their in situ position like un unnecessarily, you know, is is just I, I'd be very much against that. But I suppose in some cases where you have panels that may be at risk or panels that have been found not in their in situ position, for example, like the Mohel Stone, um, you know, to take that in and to to preserve that because you know I think I love I like I really like that initiative. I really think that's great when museums and and um you know other other local authority or any other bodies that do um you know identify the importance of these panels and do say well look they need to be on display they need to be safeguarded I think that's fantastic but actually removing panels from their in-situ um, location that that oh no <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose that yeah, we're talking about in-situ so I mean I'm going to ask you this this question about going back to the Blaze O'Connor research which was fantastic and and then mm -hmm. I'll follow that up with asking you about maybe your 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 a case study or a favorite case study of yours in terms of what's on the stone and maybe uh, you know how, how you recorded it if you sort of used any new methods but so i'll start the first part of that question then if we're just going back to because we mentioned it earlier that's one of the very few and maybe the only um rock art site in ireland that's had a sort of full archaeological excavation around it and also found what we think is a contemporary archaeological material. Could you tell us a little bit more about, about that um, that site in County Monaghan, please? Yes, so Blaise O'Connor, it is the only um, excavation that took place in Ireland on a rock art site. And it was formed part of Blaise O'Connor's um, thesis, um, PhD thesis, which is just fantastic. And, and it's such a valuable, valuable research uh, resource for other rock art researchers and for archaeologists in general it's just such a fantastic contribution and yeah it's the first and only uh, as of now um excavation of a rock art site and i suppose um up in in um louth and monaghan that would be one of the the highest concentrations of of rock art also and yeah blaze did an excavation there um and she found like a number of like stone line pits and she found beads um and she found a number of other um artifacts and i suppose just you know it would be great to kind of see some more um excavations or more initiatives around that throughout the country and um, you know i think it's fantastic to have that and it's just brilliant and I I know that there are excavations um, elsewhere, you know, in, in the world uh, on rock art sites, but it would be great, especially with the increasing number of rock art panels that have been discovered in the Southwest. It would just be fantastic to see an excavation like uh, like that or, uh, you know, to take place there, especially in, you know, in on the Evero Peninsula, which would be like the highest concentration of, of art at the moment. And, you know, if, you know, I, and I, you, I'll say this to many archaeologists, if funding weren't a problem, <laughs> which either micro region uh, yeah no, you're 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 right to laugh um, if funding weren't a problem which site or which you know valley would you concentrate your resources on if you if you could excavate either an area or a particular outcrop or even a particular panel and do you have any candidates i suppose i'm sort of asking maybe i'm getting into the foothills of like what is your favorite or what a site do you think is most promising in all your research 
Okay, well, um, I have to say that's absolutely hands down. That is uh, Letter West. Letter West is a townland on the Evero Peninsula and it has neighbouring townlands of Kuma Saharan and of Kieldorf Upper. And um, the analysis on those panels actually dates back to, you know, the early 20th century and possibly before it. Um, so, you know, there are those three townlands that are three neighbouring townlands um, and the art there is just absolutely phenomenal that's where the pieces in letter west specifically that's where the the uh, blanket peat is is um is you know kind of uh god my brain and um, the blanket peat is uh you know starting to reveal more um panels um and it's really really becoming kind of the the rock art capital um really i know there are panels in donegal and stuff and 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 um the Inishowen Peninsula and I know there are fantastic examples being revealed there but I have to say obviously just because you know slightly biased from my research that the, the Letter West Townland is just absolutely amazing it's just breathtaking and you know when you look at it from you know a, a prehistoric times they weren't they weren't divided into three townlands so it was just one specific area so when you think about that like you go into Letter West and unfortunately at the moment there's a um there's a water uh filtration system or center on, on the land um which is kind of you know it, it does kind of it's a bit of an eyesore when you look at these stunning landscapes and it's basically like an amphitheater of hills and there's lakes and there's it's just apt I live there like you know it's just gorgeous but um yeah uh, it's just stunning you could spend days and days and days just you know walking around it and look like everywhere you look there's a piece of fantastic like really elaborate rock art um so it's great so I would 100 percent letter west on the Everall Peninsula definitely needs an excavation so if anyone wants to give us funding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will emphasize this point in the program. Please give archaeologists more funding to go to beautiful parts of the world and do, do, do archaeology. But that 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 sounds um yeah, and amazing. I, I, you've you, you've done the work for Visit Ireland uh for you as well. I, I want to go there now and 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 have a look. So you know, that's a project you'd like, you know, ideally like to do in the future. What, again, you've talked about a few of them, like Northumberland and, and Durham. What what other amazing projects are out there? Because there are ones in Scotland as well. Yes. Are there ones that you could tell people that they can maybe get involved in or go to their websites? Yes, well, the Scottish Rock Art Project that just concluded, I think, at the end of, of last year, well, that is just absolutely amazing. And Joanna Valdez and her team did some amazing work there. It's just absolutely fantastic. And it's great to see these initiatives, you know, uh, across Europe and and. and and specifically and um, the, the Scottish Rock Art Project I 100% recommend people to to visit their website and, and, and you know check it out because it's just so so well worth worth a look and it really does showcase what fantastic art and, and what great archaeologists are um you know after revealing there and I suppose we're sort of getting to the end now and, and and you know we will give out links to your you're on Instagram you're on it was called Twitter. Uh, it's now called X. Um, you're also, or oh, you've got a, a, a website as well. I'll, I'll let you give out the, the, those um, links. Are there any other uh, resources? I, I believe sort of archaeology.ie is a good place to look at yes. a map if, you, if you're wanting to find them. So if I've been, as I'm sure you know, everyone listening to this will be enthused by, if they want to find out more about rock art in Ireland you know, today, what, what web resources are, are are there for them to sort of have a look at? Yes, yeah, so I suppose archaeology.ie would be the main one in terms of, um, you know, the, the location and the district distribution of the of the rock art. So archaeology.ie, if you go onto that, um, you can type in your townland, your county, and what kind of monument that you're looking for. So you could put in Kerry, Letter West, rock, uh, rock Art, and you can click Go. And it would basically tell you the coordinates of these panels. And it's great um, because um, there's a lot of work being done there at the moment. And also, um, you know, because there's some of these panels have, have such, you know, historic records that the National Monument Service, actually some of them, when you click on them, it'll show you the historic records and all the references for those panels. So it's a really great resource. Um, and also then it will help people that might have might have stumbled across something new, a new piece of rock art or, you know, they kind of want to double check if it's been recorded or not. If you if you go on to archaeology.ie and kind of cross reference, you know, what you found yourself to, um, do you know, the panel in front of you um, or what you found yourself to the panel on the on the archaeology.ie, you'll be able to kind of, you know, diff like work out whether it's a new panel or whether it's something that's been previously recorded. 
And yeah, that's uh, as well. I mean, you because you're not just online. You, you've written um, uh, chapters in books, and you've written uh, a guide that people can 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 download as a PDF, as I did myself. Would could you tell people a bit more about anything else that they you know they they, they love your work? They want to read more stuff specifically by you. Um, yes, so I suppose the Heritage Council, um, I was really, really fortunate and, and I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to work with the Heritage Council here in Ireland. So the Heritage Council are just fantastic. They fund some amazing projects. They really help community archaeology. They really help adopt a monument. They have a, a program, Adopt a Monument. Um, the head of conservation, Ian Doyle, he's just an absolutely, you know, he's fantastic. Um, and he really is. He encourages so many community groups. And, you know, they really do help with the preservation and kind of the promotion of, of archaeology. And um, I did um, write a, uh, I suppose, a PDF online um, with them a few years ago um, on, you know, a little like it was uh, our ancient landscapes, prehistoric rock art in Ireland. So what it did was really just give um, readers kind of an overview and a background to prehistoric rock art in Ireland with, with a view to creating awareness and hopefully then in turn creating, you know, having more higher levels of conservation and, and understanding. And it's it's um, it's also got some amazing photographs in it. Can you, could you give us um, just the, the details of the, the photographer who's sort of known for um, uh, amazing photographs of, of, of the rock art, that you get to see rock art, but they've got beautiful wildlife and backgrounds in it as well. As, um, I could give some more information on that. Yeah, um, Ken Ken Williams. He's shadows and stone. If anyone wants to see some amazing um, images, he's he's fantastic. He's a fantastic photographer. I first worked with him back in 2015, and um, when I um, uh, curated an exhibition on um, prehistoric rock art in the Cork Public Museum, um, and it was he's just great to work with, and his work is just amazing. So I'm delighted that he his photographs were included in the in that publication. But yes, yeah, shadows and stone. If anyone is looking um, to look at more of uh, Ken's work. They are absolutely gorgeous photographs. The art's beautiful. The the background, the sort of slightly confused looking cows in them, are yeah. <laughs> are great as well. But it just I, I, absolutely, if you know, if, if nothing else, th this podcast combined with that with that PDF, we'll give out the links with all the images in it and 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 Ken's work as well as Claire's work. Um, you've also written a, a chapter as well, um, or a signaling and performance uh, book. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about 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 that. Yes, so I suppose um Aaron Aaron Mazel and George Nash um they're based in the UK. Um Aaron is um associated with Northumberland University or Newcastle University, um and he is he's they're both fantastic researchers in in the field of rock art and they have established um Bragg the British Rock Art Group and that's I suppose how I first met them, um and Bragg then I suppose has an annual conference um where researchers from across the globe can go and present their research you know on different aspects of of rock art and you know that's how I, I first met them and I know Aaron is from he's from Cape Town and he did his research on um our rock art in in South Africa and cons conserving it so it was really great to talk to somebody from a different part of the world doing a similar project when I was completing mine so it was great um and yeah I know that Aaron and George are just fantastic and brag if anyone um fancies even if you're not an archaeologist or a, a rock art researcher it's well worth um well worth a visit to one of the brag conferences because there's just so much we had um uh, recently it was Charlie Charlotte Vendome Gardner, who's looking at um, flu player imagery um, in Native American art. You can have anything from that to, you know, the, the hills of Kerry to, you know, rock art on the continent and in, you know, um, the Middle East and, you know, Eastern Europe. It's it's great. It's a wide variety. And anyone that's interested in rock art should definitely try and grab a, a Bragg conference at some point. And you were just recently talking at one of, of uh, we'd like to just tell us a little bit about the talk that that, that, that you gave uh, there. Well, I had hoped to uh, be attending that. Unfortunately, my flight was cancelled last minute, oh, no. but I, you know, yeah. Um, but I had prepared a presentation on the Mohill Stone. So the Mohill Stone, um, I currently work in, in tourism in Waterford. So I suppose trying to find the um the balance between marketing and conservation now is at you know, it's at its finest. So um I suppose I, I kind of picked the example of the Mohill Stone in in Waterford, the only example of of uh, rock art in the region. And I suppose it kind of has an interesting history in terms of um there was a researcher, Susan Johnson, um and 
like I think it was the the nineties. Um, I might I may be wrong, but I'm fairly sure it was the nineties um, or the eighties that was overlooking from from the states, and she was doing research on rock art um, here in Ireland. And she kind of released a, a paper, um, you know, a prop, three problematic stones from uh, from Ireland, and she couldn't locate the Mohill stone. And then Elizabeth, she actually managed to to uh, to locate the stone. It was on display in the Stone Corridor in UCC, so it had actually been been removed, and you know, it had been put on display in in the Stone Corridor. So it's an interesting panel, and anyone who's interested in, um, you know, checking out the the Stone Corridor, there there are a few examples of rock art down there in in UCC as well as Ohm stones. So it's it's a really good, it's a really good spot. Yes. And um if if there's anywhere there's a there's a there's a, a corridor of carved stones from whichever period I think any archaeologist or anyone interested in history in the past will will need to go and go go and see. And well I think you know that's that's a great place to 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 end this. I think we've all learned so much. I mean I, I do obviously some as much research as I can into these, and I, I read I read your stuff, and I've listened to some of some of your talks. But your enthusiasm for it, it really, really came across. And I mean, I think hopefully you you do get that uh, million uh, euro grant, and uh, and and can spend a, a few years looking at your at your at your dream dream sites. Um, you certainly deserve it with the amazing work and all the outreach that you do. And thank you from behalf of the Red River Archaeology Group and the Shindig and our producer Luke and myself for for talking with us today. And uh, yeah, well, best of luck in the future, and hopefully we'll get you on again. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I really enjoyed it, and it's great to talk about rock art. <laughs> you know said in the, the the intro that you know um it's just it's fascinating and it's not often we see because you know we've talked in a lot of these podcasts about you know the research and the actual history and archaeology of, a, of an artifact or a range of artifacts but to to talk to someone that's looking at how it will still be preserved for future generations is something we've not really had before yeah it's interesting and it's again like i say this a lot it's very much in keeping with what we're trying to do here um, preserving things for a next generation telling these stories it's kind of I suppose for myself I'm on a I'm on a massive learning journey with these things because I know nothing about any of the subjects we're talking about and I hope that there are people listening and watching who also are interested but maybe don't know a whole lot as well as some experts and people who like yourself who know an awful lot about these things because um, I'd love I'd love for people listening to the shindig or watching the shindig to be coming along on the journey with me and learning an awful lot along the way as well, like I did with this episode and all the previous ones, which you can listen back to. Yeah, and I mean, Luke's saying there, I learned a lot as well because the preservation is not something I know so much about myself. So, you know, every day is a school day and if, if Claire's your teacher, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd actually yeah. look forward to going to school. That's the I thing. Think, so. I love when we get people on who love to talk about, and most people we get on love to talk about the, their, I suppose, chosen subject. And and Claire was somebody who was absolutely amazing at doing that. And you can see the passion, the the love she has for it and how engaged she is with it. And that's amazing. It's great to see. And uh, yeah, well, um, I'll just say thank you for listening. Thanks again to Claire. And as ever, leave it to Luke because Luke remembers all the bits that I forget at the end of a podcast. Make sure to subscribe to us, guys, if you want us to, if you want to keep getting us into your ears every two weeks, filling you up with loads of historical facts and amazing archaeology. Uh, hit subscribe, hit follow, um, follow us on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. Maybe look us up on Twitter or X or whatever it's called this week and <laughs> follow us on Instagram, on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. If you have anything interesting that you'd like to show up on the shindig, drop us a DM at us anywhere you see us. We'd love to hear from you. We have some great stuff coming up in the future. So make sure to hit subscribe, hit rate, hit review and tell some people about us. Cause we'd love to spread this around. Agreed with all of that. And uh, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks guys.